colleagues and guests, uh, welcome all. Thank you for join, uh, joining us in these difficult times. Happy as we would have been to host you here in Be'er Sheva, I must admit that during the last fortnight, the prospect of a Zoom conference felt rather reassuring. I believe that we all are still very much under the impression of the so recent cycle of violence, yet I'm pretty sure that once we begin, we will immerse ourselves in the challenge and the joy of the intellectual endeavor before us. Unfortunately, it's less of a social occasion on Zoom, but we will try our best maybe between sessions. We even dare hope that by bringing together scholars working on Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, our workshop will contribute in its own very humble way to promoting dialogue and mutual understanding, not to mention collegiality and scholarship. Revisiting Neil McGregor's A History of the World in 100 Objects, a book written in 200, 2010, in a somewhat critical tone, Miriam Brucius suggests, with some exaggeration perhaps, that one could also write 10 histories of the world in one object. I find both ideas appealing. Inquiries regarding the origins of objects, their production, the alteration they underwent, their appropriation and adjustment by different users, the plurality of their meaning and functions, the knowledge that circulates with objects as they traverse space and time, the means of their authentication, the way by which they reflect and shape devotional sensibilities, all store multiple possibilities for creative work. The study of ritual objects ties into the study of religious practice, identity, piety, politics, and power relations. It may shed light on social and economic aspects of the production, consumption, circulation, and exchange of religious commodities. Including objects in the study of religious phenomena allows for better understanding of how religion works in the lives of individuals and communities, especially of those who did not leave written records. Artifacts can provide evidence about religious change that may complement or even challenge text-based narratives. With time, they're likely to take on forms and meanings that could never have been imagined at the outset, documenting not only the period of their production, but also later periods which altered them. To study ritual objects, one must explore the relationship between the artifacts and ideas, as well as sensual, aesthetic, and spiritual experiences. Such studies might be carried out through the close study of actual material objects, but also, as most of us do, through a plethora of textual sources, ranging from legal literature of sorts to magical charms, theological treatises, mythologies, inscriptions, and various historical documents. Judging by the proliferation of recent conferences, studies groups, journals, and publications on religion and materiality, the material turn in religious studies has indeed influenced the field significantly in the last two decades, overcoming the earlier very Protestant understanding of religion as standing in sharp contrast with matter and materiality. Apparently, such an attitude was still prevalent in some institutions, at least, only 10 years ago, as Birgit Mayer, whom we hosted on Zoom, of course, uh, a fortnight ago, wrote the following in just 10 years ago, in 2011. Far from constituting an oxymoron, the phrase material religion brings to the fore an irreducible relationship. Intended as a provocative shout to signal the need for a new approach, Material religion is, in fact, a pleonasm that will become obsolete once the study of religion has been materialized. In this forum of historians, art historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, folklorists, this is surely preaching to the choir. So I need not go on and convince you all why uh, our conference is uh, um, really in line both with uh, current trends and still I think that this very um, specific emphasis on ritual objects 
of the medieval Middle East, of all the religions of the medieval Middle East, uh, has not been tried before. Our program consists of nine sessions, which include two virtual tours, which I really urge you not to miss. One, one is of the wonderful collection of relics and liturgical objects of the Franciscan order in Jerusalem. The other of a new and really original exhibition presenting modern perspectives on Jewish medieval objects. Having received such a diverse set of proposals from papers from many of you here, it was not easy to decide how to divide them into sessions. We could have chosen a chronological, geographical or disciplinary principle, or perhaps concentrate on the functions of objects and dedicate sessions to pilgrimage, prayer, recitation, sorcery, intercession, construction of authority and hierarchy, and so forth. Finally, we decided to group together stones, textiles, scriptures, mosque, mosque artifacts, magical objects, icons and relics, and enjoy, in most sessions, a diversity of approaches, periods, and denominations. Before we begin, allow me another moment, I'd like to turn your attention very briskly to one of the three objects on our poster, the yellow mahmal, holy palanquin, and I'll show for those who haven't uh, gone through our um, poster very carefully, I would like to uh, to present this here. This is it. Um, and uh, just take, take, take a moment to look at this, uh, at the object at the very middle of the, uh, of the lithograph. Um, this mahmal is depicted in a beautiful, to my taste at least, stencil printed lithograph kept in the, at the, in the British Museum. It sits atop a camel, surrounded by pilgrims departing from Mecca, sorry, departing from Egypt to Mecca, accompanied by members of the religious establishment of Cairo and the Sufi orders, musicians, state officials, and soldiers. The Mahmal became the centerpiece of the Egyptian caravan since 1270, when Sultan Baibars initiated its addition to the annual parade, which used to carry the new Kiswa, an embroidered cover, sometimes named also as veil or protective mantle of the black stone, and note the various connotations that each translation carries with it. In medieval times, it used to leave Cairo in the sacred month of Rajab, that is three months before the Hajj rituals. It was an object that connected sacred places. It departed from the shrine mosque in honor of Hussein, the martyred grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, arrived at the holy sanctuary of Mecca, and on the way, visited the Prophet's mosque tomb in Medina. It also traversed sacred times, the privileged month of Rajab and Dhul Hijjah. And being decorated with Quranic phrases and the emblem of the ruler, it represented religious devotion and sultanic power. Richard McGregor, who devoted a whole chapter of his new book to this object, suggests that it could be seen as a virtual pilgrim on the Hajj, a projection of political authority, a relic carrying back home the baraka, the blessing of the prophet's tomb, a mobile simulacrum of the shri saint shrine, or simply a beautiful artwork. The Mahmal of the last Mamluk Sultan of Egypt is kept today in the Topkapi Museum of Istanbul. The last Ottoman Mahmal in Syria was transferred to the National Museum of Damascus in 1224. The very last Mahmal to retire was sent to the Museum of Islamic Art in Cairo in 1953. Due to the hostile attitude of both modernists and fundamentalists towards the Mahmal, some arguing that the veneration of any object other than the Kaaba, which we will soon hear about more in this very session, and, uh, well, some argued against the veneration of any object but the Kaaba, other denounced the sometimes unruly celebrations that accompanied the parade. So for all these trapping the Mahmal in the museum and neutralizing its religious functions seemed like a good solution for the Egyptian Ministry of Interior. 
I could go on using this artistic description of the project of the object as a springboard for a discussion of ritual objects as gifts, as representations in, in, uh, of Islamic art in Western discourse and art as hybrid objects, objects in museums. But as we have nine sessions before us, I better stop here. But not before I thank cordially. Uh, first of all, my friend and colleague, Yoni Brack. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you, and I hope it will be a pleasure to go through this conference together. Um, many, many thanks to Raya, uh, the one and only, uh, the administrative, um, the, the administration of the uh, Center for the Study of uh, Religious Conversion and Interreligious Encounters, who worked under really, really hard conditions and uh, did everything before every every thought of every detail before we even did. I'd like to thank the head of my department, Professor Avi Rubin, um, the chair of Middle East Studies Department, and Aliza Uzan Suisa, its administrative manager. Uh, thank you to Professor Efi Shaw, the chair of the Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters, who both share, are both patrons of this uh, uh, workshop. A thank you to the Israel Science Fund for funding our virtu virtual tour. And once again, thank you all participants, chairs, guests. I'm really happy that you all stuck with us, despite two postponement twice postponing this uh, uh, workshop. And I wish us all four thought-provoking, interesting, and pleasurable afternoons together. Thank you. Avi, it's your turn. Uh, thanks, Daniela. Um, I, well, according to the program, I'm supposed to say a few words in, in my capacity as the chair and then move on to, um, to, to administer the, the, the session. So uh, yeah, uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to our international workshop. Um, our department has been holding international workshops for more than 20 years, almost on a yearly basis. Um, and, and I'm sure you will agree that there is nothing in our academic life that equals a good workshop. Uh, no departmental seminar or conference can compete with the intellectual stimulus of the workshop given its intensity and, 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 and also with, with the sociability that comes with it. Um, in normal days, we would conclude each day of intellectual exchange uh, with an excellent dinner and uh, a good uh, chat. Uh, but these, of course, are not normal days and we have to make do with this uh, virtual platform. Um, the, the global pandemic is dictating our life. Um, until a few days ago, as Daniela mentioned, the lives of uh, Israelis and Palestinians have been eclipsed by yet another event that has left us uh, breathless here, uh, causing much suffering and pain. Um, I must share with you an anecdote. Last Thursday, I participated in, in a Zoom session uh, of an international research group that has been meeting for three, day, for three years now. At a certain point in the discussion, the siren went on and I had to rush to um, our uh, in-house shelter together with my family. Um, and in the meanwhile, my Zoom friends from across the world could hear the, this creepy sound of exploding rocket. So 10 minutes later, I returned to the discussion and moved on. Um, and I don't know what was more shocking uh, to my colleagues, actually disturbing. Was it the sound of siren or the fact that I carried on with the discussion as if nothing had happened? Um, and, and I told them that at least um, me and my family benefit from the privilege of sirens and shelter, uh, luxuries that families in Gaza can only dream of. Uh, and this is, of course, heartbreaking. Um, unlike COVID-19, the last round of violence uh, was not a force majeure, uh, but an event that could be avoided. Academic events like uh, this workshop uh, provide us with an opportunity to present an alternative uh, to political cynicism, nationalistic bigotry, 
and religious fanaticism. Um, academic exchanges are bridges and we are builders of intellectual bridges. So um, with this note, I, I, I wish you and us um, a productive and enjoyable ride into the mysteries of medieval Middle East. Um, and I think we are good to move on to our first uh, panel. Right, Daniela? Yoni? Yes, thank you very much, Avi. Okay, so uh, our first panel, the title of our first panel is Tones as Devotional Objects, and I would like to present Professor Brannon Wheeler, um, who teaches history of religious Middle East and Bible at the United States Nav Naval Academy in Annapolis. He has authored and edited a number of books, uh, including Meccan and Eden, Rituals, Relics, and Territory in Islam uh, by uh, Chicago uh, University Press. Uh, Professor Wheeler received his PhD from the University of Chicago, has taught at a number of universities around the world, and held visiting positions throughout the Middle East and Europe. His current research focuses on ritualized violence uh, in the camel sacrifice on the Prophet Muhammad, uh, and, is, uh, and it is forthcoming as animal sacrifice and the origin and the origins of Islam by uh, Cambridge University Press. Uh, so, Professor Wheeler, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, even though we're all really good at Zoom meetings now, it's still tricky to make sure we get it right. <laughs> <laughs> so you can all see my sc screen shared? Yeah. We can. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> so, so why is the touching of certain things encouraged or even required? And why is the touching of other things restricted or forbidden? <clears throat> so when Daniela told me about this conference almost two years ago, I immediately started thinking about things you could and couldn't touch. And I had written some things on what you could and couldn't eat, which is a type of touch, I suppose. And I'd written something on touching certain parts of the body being restricted in Islamic law. But it struck me that I couldn't really immediately think of things you had to touch, things that were required to touch. Um, <clears throat> as Avi said, I've been <clears throat> thinking about the Kaaba and the Hajj for some time. So it struck me, maybe I should think a little bit more about the Black Stone. <clears throat> what I immediately found striking about it was the sensual or sexual nature of the touch. So the Black Stone is not only touched, but it's kissed and it's caressed and it's prostrated upon. And especially because <clears throat> it's this sensual, sexual type of touch, touching one's own body or other people's bodies, that's so restricted in Islamic law and practice. <clears throat> so my question is, why is the touching of the black stone required and the touching of one's own body forbidden? <clears throat> so this is the outline of a whole lot of material that I can't possibly cover in 18 and a half minutes. Um, and each slide has more material than I'm possibly going to go through but I figured I would just put it all there. And if anybody wants a copy of this afterwards, I'd be happy to show it to them. Um, <clears throat> so I'll first talk about the black stone itself, then um, a particular example of touching a, a body or a body part, and then finally try to suggest a more generic um, typology, both of object types and of the effects of touching objects both upon the object and the person touching it, and hopefully spur some discussion. I'm very happy that I get to go first because that means I get to learn from everybody else um, as <clears throat> this conference or workshop proceeds. <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to explain all the pictures, but I did want to point out that um, the black stone itself is actually eight pieces of black stone. One of them is actually split um, near the middle. So maybe it's actually nine pieces. So even though I'm gonna call it the black stone, there, there are actually eight of them. <laughs> so, so let me first talk about the black stone. <clears throat> so I've divided this into different sections. All of these 
um, points are taken from the standard collections of, of Hadith reports. And if I had time, I could go through even more sources. So let me start just by um, highlighting each one of these, these slides. So if we look at the practices of early Muslims, a couple of things stands out. Uh, one is there's a lot of reports attributed to Omar, um, who basically says, it's just a rock, uh, but we're going to kiss it because the Prophet Muhammad did so. Um, <clears throat> and there are other reports of Ibn Abbas and other people who kiss the black stone, rub their hands over it, prostrate themselves on it, uh, stand there and, and pray or do various things um, at the black stone. <clears throat> <clears throat> for um, if I had time, we could talk about another of the corners of the Kaaba, which is also touched. Um, it's not um, extrapolated as much in Islamic law, uh, but there's another corner called the Rukun Yemeni or the Yemeni corner, um, which is also supposed to be touched as you circumambulate the Kaaba. And of course, some people touch all four corners as uh, Muawiyah used to do. So this is actually, you can see in the lower <clears throat> left-hand corner, the actual place in the Kaaba where this corner is. <clears throat> so I don't know what, how to translate Fada'il, so I translated it as mythology. Um, there's a lot of stories about <clears throat> the Black Stone, where it was from and what it was. Um, <clears throat> the stone itself has heavenly origins, or perhaps we could say it comes from the garden, the Jinnah. Um, originally was an angel, it was turned into a jewel. Adam took it with him when he fell. He transferred it to Abu Kobais, or God transferred it there. <clears throat> the mountain moved from Khorasan to Mecca, and Abraham retrieved the stone from the mountain and then inserted it into the Kaaba. Uh, the stone used to be white, but because people touched it and their sins were removed from them, it became blackened, or it was blackened when a menstruating woman touched it. And there's a longer explanation of that, which we don't have time for, that has to do with Hajar and some other things. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad used to have a sliver of the black stone uh, that he wore against his skin at all times, and it gave him the ability to see forward and backward in time. Um, when God removed all the descendants from Adam, which is all of us, um, before he put him um, on earth, um, the, all of those people made a covenant of allegiance with God, and the text of that covenant was then placed inside of the black stone. The black stone itself has an eyes and mouth. Um, it used to greet the prophet Muhammad uh, before he started receiving revelations, and it will testify on the day of judgment on behalf of the people uh, who touched it. Um, and finally, uh, many say that the black stone is the face or the hand of God, so that when you're kissing it, it's like kissing the hand of God and making allegiance uh, to him. So <clears throat> what did the prophet Muhammad say and do regarding the black stone? Um, of course, there's a lot of this, so again, let me highlight it. So the first chunk here is from the time when the prophet Muhammad made Hajj, so he only made Hajj one time, although he did a number of Umrahs, um, and so the final time he, he went to Mecca um, to perform the ritual, he was on a camel. So he either pointed at the black stone or he pointed with it, at it with a stick or he touched it with a stick. Uh, sometimes he said, Allahu Akbar. Sometimes he touched the stick after, or he kissed the stick after he pointed it at the Kaaba. Uh, so a lot of different things. Um, there's reports of the Prophet Muhammad kissing the black stone. Um, he starts his, what I've translated as fast ritual walk, the Rommel, which is the first fast three laps around the Kaaba before doing four more slowly. Um, he touches it with his hands. Uh, he salutes it. He prostrates himself next to it. Uh, he used to pray toward the black stone. And finally, uh, he said, may God curse the Jews three times at the black stone. <clears throat> So clearly, even before we start getting into Islamic law, some Muslims were uncomfortable with the idea of kissing the black stone. So you can see um, kind of a selection here of both retractions and additions. So uh, some people say this is optional. If you can't actually get to the stone, you can just say the Shahada and a Takbir while you're looking at it and that's okay. 
Other people say, well, you might as well not even come to Mecca if you're not planning on touching it, right? Leave your what if in Yemen, don't even come if you're not gonna actually touch the black stone. Um, there's retractions about whether you should do the Rommel itself because the only reason that the Prophet Muhammad wanted his followers to walk three times fast around the Kaaba is because the pagan Meccans were watching them and they actually had, uh, they were sick from a fever and Muhammad didn't want any of the Meccans to know that they were sick. So he had them walk really fast, but he couldn't do the full seven because they were so sick. So they only did three times around. So that remains um, a practice, even though people say, maybe uh, we don't have to do that anymore. Um, some people say you shouldn't touch the black stone because Muhammad never did it. And even Aisha refuses to go and touch the black stone with other women who wanted to go. So the final thing in the, in the bottom right-hand corner for Ibn Rushd is kind of a summary of what later Islamic law says, which that um, if you go and circumambulate the Kaaba, you're required to kiss the black stone. And if you can't, then you should touch it and kiss your hand in place of kiss, kissing the stone. Okay. So let's, let's juxtapose that then to, well, first, here's, here's an image for those of you who are not familiar with the Kaaba, and you can kind of see, I don't know if you can't see my cursor really, but there's the black stone, here's the door, and the uh, Yemeni corner uh, over here on the, the other side. <clears throat> so let's juxtapose that to, to touching one's own or another person's body, which is restricted in Islamic law. So the reason the text looks different here is because I wrote an article about this uh, many years ago, too many that for me to count. And so I basically just cut and pasted from the article. So you can go and read the article if you want to get the fuller version of this. But the basic point is, is that um, touching one's penis or one's genitals requires you to perform wudu. So this is one of the two types of purification that Muslims have to perform before doing any ritual. And the wudu'a is the one that you probably most commonly see, if you're not familiar with this, of wiping your feet and your hands uh, and your head. Um, so the kind of general overview can be seen from Shafi'i's text, where he gives the necessity of doing um, the purification with a whole list of other things uh, that would cause you to do that. So for those of you who are familiar with this, right? It includes going to the bathroom or sleeping or um, any sort of, of um, contact with a substance that would come out of the body. <clears throat> um, and of course, it also includes, as you can see around the middle of the paragraph, touching the genitals of himself or someone else with the palm of the hand, whether the person whose genitals are touched is big or small, alive or dead, male or female. <clears throat> so, for the sake of, of brevity, what I did is I divided the Muslim legal opinions really into three sections of why is it that touching the penis um, causes impurity. So one, one category, one explanation is that because you're touching it for sexual pleasure. So you can see, again, I won't read all of these, but you can read some of them yourself while I'm highlighting them. You can see that the jurists compare it to touching a woman um, other jurists say the reason you're touching it is because you're masturbating or that there's just some sort of uh, sexual pleasure, which is the intention of touching it. And that's why uh, you become impure when you do so. Um, other jurists say that has nothing to do with intention. Um, just touching the genitals of anything, um, including the penis of a corpse, a severed penis, or even animal genitals. Um, requires you to have to perform <clears throat> a purification. And then <clears throat> another group of scholars, and these are mostly the Hanafis, say that it has nothing to do with the body part itself, but it has to do with their impure substances that come out of that body part. And so if you're going to touch it, it's a good chance that you came into contact with one of those impure substances. Um, so you're going to have to perform a purification because of that. <clears throat> All right, so we have we have two uh, two objects, let's say, um, that are supposed to be touched or not supposed to be touched. So I thought, so let's start off with looking at the Islamic typology for touching. So 
the way we would do that is by doing this, right? We take the Islamic legal categories, there's six of them, we run them across the top and they go from required to forbidden. And then we could add to each one of these columns, particular um, objects, right? So we would put the black stone in the required column at the left and we would put the penis in the forbidden column at the right. And then we could add stuff in the middle. So I thought about doing this for a while and I thought, yeah, that's great because, but it doesn't really tell us much. What we'll end up finding out is something like, well, the reason they're here is because the prophet Muhammad said that, uh, but we know that's not actually true, right? Because sometimes some people said he never actually kissed the black stone or he did something else. So we wouldn't really get a, a very serious answer. So I thought about this a little bit more and I thought, well, we've got plenty of examples in the history of religion for things we're not supposed to touch. And in the Islamic case, we have lots of examples. And in most other religions, probably being too general here, right? But in Judaism and Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, it's the same um, bodies that are often forbidden. Uh, so we've got a lot of examples of that, but we don't have a lot of examples, at least I'm not aware of, of things you're supposed to touch. So what I did, which I think is, um, I don't know how you'd call it, but I think it's a good idea, is I enlisted the help of my students. I was teaching a class in history of religions, and I said, each one of you come up with a list of objects that you're supposed to touch. So that's what we did. Uh, this is the list that we came up with. Um, it's supposed to be 42 different things, but some of them are repeats because the students didn't follow directions and they wrote the same thing in their list that somebody else wrote in their list. So you'll see one heads up penny comes in one place and lucky penny comes in another place. So it's the, it's the same thing. But you've got about 40 different things here um, that you're supposed to touch. And it's not necessarily required touching, but you're supposed to touch it and people do. So what we did is we, we took the list and in an attempt to try to figure out a typology, um, we then put it on a spreadsheet. So you can see, so black stone, and then you list underneath the black stone, uh, all the reasons, right? Where did it come from? Or why do you do it? What is it supposed to be? And then you list other things, right? So you've got the mezuzah and you lift it over here and you put things on here and you try to match them up. And you might actually go below, right? You're adding things that aren't part of the black stone. And you start to find interesting things. One of them is that, well, like almost everyone, other people do it, right? So that's probably a useless category to even have. Um, but I was, I was surprised, for example, when one of the students brought up the moon rock. You're supposed to, when you go to the Kennedy Space Center, go in and touch the moon rock. It actually has um, six things in common with the black stone, including uh, its heavenly origins. And it's a very rare object. And it's part of a visit or a pilgrimage to this special, special place. So the idea of doing this is not to, to give us any conclusions, but kind of heuristically help us start to think about what are the categories of objects or touching that we're talking about. So in order to kind of operationalize this, and I know you're not gonna be able to see this too well, but then we created a flow chart. Um, the idea of a flow chart is kind of like a game. You take your object and you start with box number one, and then you answer the question and you know, is it touching restricted or enjoined? It's enjoined, so you go to the next box and you answer all the questions. And the idea is that at the end, you'll end up in one of these diamonds. So there's 14 diamonds, there's supposed to be 15 because this one's supposed to be split up into good luck charms and um, non like ritual aids, but I'm sorry, I didn't have room at the bottom of the, of the chart. Um, and you get all of those um, objects and that represents your object type. The other thing that we're interested in is the effect of touching it. So that is what this less complicated and more easy to read chart is supposed to do. So if the, <clears throat> so for example, if, the, if touching it has, has no consequence, then it's a non-ritual object. So we just take it off the chart. If it has a consequence, then we have to decide, does it affect the object? That is it affect the person touching it or both? Um, and then we can, we can eventually get to diamonds again, right? Reusable, sacred object, so forth. And we get, what is that? Uh, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different, different objects. So what we end up with is this list. And again, this is a heuristic list that's supposed to help us to try to understand the difference between the black stone um, and the penis. So over on the left-hand side, those are the object types. And I put them into the restricted ones. So things you're not supposed to touch and the enjoin meaning things you are supposed to touch. 
And over on the right-hand side are the consequences of touching. So the first three are affect the object and the second two affects the person doing the touching, the toucher. I don't know if that's a noun, <laughs> but the, the person uh, doing the touching. Um, <clears throat> so how does this all add up to what we, what I think I can say in, a, in two minutes about the black stone and its required touching? So <clears throat> both the black stone and the penis are touched in a way that's sensual or sexual. That's the way it's described by the people who are evaluating whether you should touch it, how you should touch it, or whether you shouldn't touch it. Um, after that, we start to see some differences between the two, and I just want to talk about each of those uh, differences for just a minute. So the black stone is a unique object. I put sacred with a question mark. Is that what we mean by sacred? Is it a sacred object? I don't know if that's helpful or not. Whereas the, uh, the penis is a common or profane body part, right? Every, everybody has genitals of some sort, um, and so it's a, it's a common thing. Um, by profane, I think I mean that it's susceptible to, to impurity, right? It can become impure. But sacred objects can also be defiled, um, so I'm not sure that's that helpful. Um, the black stone's hard to touch, right? You got to go all the way to Mecca to do it. There's going to be a lot of people there. There's going to be a long line. And during COVID, you got to wait till they spray it in between the kissings, right? So you don't catch COVID when you're kissing it, but you're supposed to touch it. Whereas your genitals, you have to touch them multiple times a day, but you shouldn't. So you get kind of a shark, uh, sharp or uh, contrast or stark contrast is what I meant to say. <clears throat> so the black stone removes your sin when you touch it or removes your impurity, whereas touching your genitals actually makes you impure by touching it. So both of them transmit something, but they transmit in opposite directions. It's interesting now that both of them are reminders of the pre-fall Eden, right? So remember <clears throat> the black stone is a reminder of the covenant the descendants of Adam made with God before he was forced to leave the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve didn't know they even had genitals when they were in the Garden of Eden. It was only after they um, ate from the tree they weren't supposed to eat from and they were kicked out um, that they, they knew they had them. So one of the reminders you could say is pre-fall and one of the reminders is post-fall. <clears throat> and as I put the last a row in there, I realized, well, this could look really simplistic, right? Because obviously the black stone is a positive thing because you're supposed to do it and touching your genitals is a negative because you're not supposed to. But I was thinking more like in terms of the terminals on a battery, right? There's the positive terminal and the negative terminal. So both of these touchings remind you of something. They both remind you of the same thing, um, but one's a negative thing and one is a positive thing. <clears throat> so let me just go ahead and end there. Um, I, I suppose that you all will have questions and I have additional questions. And I will only say that um, two of the questions that I have in doing this research, research always raises more questions and answers is one is, what do you do with a ruined sacred object that you can't hide or destroy? The two examples I have are um, the Holocaust Torah scrolls and the Quran that Saddam made out of his own blood. Um, and then secondly, are there other objects that absorb impurity like the black stone does? Um, I would be curious to know if people have other examples of that. So I will, I will stop there. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Wheeler. Thanks also for keeping uh, the, with the time frame. And uh, I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Yamit Rahman Schreier, um, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Golden Mayor Trust at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her research interests include pilgrimage and artistic exchanges across the Mediterranean basin and the relationships between nature and art. She has recently published an article in the Journal of Medieval History entitled um, a Voyage to the Land of Mirrors, Felix Fabri's narration of the Virgin Mary's pilgrimages as a model for late medieval 
uh, mendicant piety. She's currently working on a, mon on a monograph about uh, pilgrimage, sacred stones, and medieval Western um, imagination. So, uh, Yamid, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to participate uh, in this uh, workshop. Uh, I'll share my screen now uh, with my uh, presentation. Um, can you see it? Okay. Perfect, yeah, it works. Great, thanks. So my paper today is dedicated uh, to the Stone of the Unction, uh, which was migrated into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, in Jerusalem sometime before 1335. I begin with a discussion of the circumstance circumstances uh, for the migration of a relic into the Jerusalemite space after the Crusaders' loss of the city in a period that Jerusalem was under Mamluk wall. I suggest that the stone migrated into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as a Franciscan uh, innovation, offering the materialization of Christ's sufferings in his humanity in the narrative space of Jerusalem. Um, the stone of the action is the object upon which, according to tradition, Christ was laid and anointed after he was taken down from his cross and prior to his entombment. The stone is situated at the southern transept of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, at the main entrance of the church. In the slide, it is marked uh, in orange, the location of the Stone of the Unction. Today, it is integrated into a rectangular structure, slightly heightened above floor level, and adorned by eight oil lamps. In its current setting, the 14th century slab is not visible for it is covered by a stony lid. The setting of the stone in the modern church differs greatly from its setting in the 14th century. Then the stone was fixed as a flattened surface at floor height. Um, as both textual and visual testimonies tell, it was a dark slab of porphyry or marble framed by a checkered pattern of black and white. The edges of this pattern are still visible in the modern setting of the stone between the marble lid and the marble barrier. Here we can see the black and white checkered um, pattern. The scene of Christ's action is depicted in the New Testament. John tells that after the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took Christ's body from Pilate. Then they wrapped it in linen and anointed it with myrrh and aloes as the manner of the Jews is to bury. No stone is mentioned in the biblical narrative. In the slide, we see a fresco from Macedonia depicting the anointing of Christ. Here too, no stone is depicted and Christ's uh, body is laid on a shroud. Uh, this is the standard uh, depiction of Christ's action in early Byzantine art. Prior to 1335, the anointing of Christ was associated with two, two different spots uh, in the church, but no stone was shown there in Jerusalem. The first spot was Christ's sepulchre itself. The pilgrim Vilibaldus, who later on became the Bishop of Eichstadt, recalls an altar within the sepulchre, which he terms Lectus, upon which the body of Christ was laid and anointed before he was put in his tomb. It is impossible to know whether the Lectus was the lid of Christ's sarcophagus or perhaps another stone slab, but the affiliation to the tomb is prominent. Later pilgrims who visited the church of the Holy Sepulchre after it was renovated by the Crusaders mention a mosaic which was fixed over the entry of Christ's tomb, showing the body of Christ being placed in the sepulchre by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, with the Virgin Mary and the three women offering pots of perf perfumes. This is the iconographical scheme which was popular in the Latin West, for example, as we see here in the slide. 
Yet, during the Crusaders' era, another spot in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre became associated with Christ's unction, a spot in the center of the newly built choir, which was believed to be the center of the earth. John of Würzburg, who visited Jerusalem circa 1170, mentioned an elevated marble table and beneath stone slabs inscribed with small circles. At the same place, place he continued, Christ also appeared to Mary Magdalene after he was resurrected, and some people say, quidem, uh, quidem asserunt, that Joseph begged the body of Jesus from Pilate. He took it down from the cross, respectfully washed it, anointing it with precious liquids, and wrapped it in clean linen. The marking of the site as circles inscribed in the floor specifically alludes to the notion of the center of the earth and not to the action of Christ. Furthermore, John of Würzburg's phrase quidam asserunt concerning the identification of the site indicates that the scene of the action was only a secondary tradition in this spot. It also implies that the tradition was not universally accepted. Yet, John's descriptions marks a crucial point in the history of the scene of the unction in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. When the scene was taken out from, the, from Christ's tomb edicula. Iris Chagrir has shown how the Easter celebration of the Visitatio Sepulchri that took place in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Crusader Jerusalem was well adapted to the architectural plan of the church. It is possible that the later identification of the place of the unction in the middle of the church's choir was in correspondence with constraints of the crusaders liturgical celebrations following the narrative sequence from Golgotha and the place of the crucifixion to the center of the earth where the unction of Christ was shown and into the tomb of Christ. We see then that during the Crusaders period, no stone of unction was shown in Jerusalem, but the site of the unction was associated either, either with the lectus within the sepulcher or a more and more towards the Crusader uh, times in the center uh, of the earth, in the middle of the choir of the church. It was only uh, circa 1335 that pilgrims accounts begin to mention a slab of stone claimed to be the stone of the unction that was shown at the entrance to the church of the Holy Sepulchre, ap approximately at the same spot where it is shown today. Jacopo of Verona reports on a stone um, of slab um, of a slab of stone of black color that was fixed to the floor level. Fifteen years afterwards, the Francesca Nicola of Bonzi, who visited uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, recalls that the stone was set on the floor of the church. It was of green porphyry, eight palms and three fingers long, and two palms and one finger wide. He also left a drawing uh, of the chess-like pattern which framed the slab of stone. According to his testimony, a visit to the stone guaranteed the devotee with indulgences. Why did stone in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre became associated with the action of Christ? And why then in 1335? In what follows, I suggest retracing the migration of the Stone of the Unction into the Jerusalemite Church in two trajectories. First, in Constantinople, where another stone, also claimed to be the Stone of the Unction, was presented to pilgrims as early as uh, 1169. And second, in 13th century Franciscan imagery of Christ's Unction. I will then return to Jerusalem uh, and the stone there. So I begin with Constantinople. More than a century and a half before the Stone of the Unction was introduced into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, a different slab of stone, also believed to be the Stone of the Unction, was on display at the Pantocrator Church in Constantinople. 
the 12th century Byzantine chronicles uh, Johannes Kinamos, uh, Kinamos and Nikitias Chonietas chronicled the story of the arrival of the stone to Constantinople. The stone was brought from Ephesus, as uh, they uh, uh, describe. Uh, the stone was brought from Ephesus to Constantinople in 1169 by the Emperor Manuel Komnenus I, who carried it on his shoulders up the hill from Bukoyan Harbor to the Faust Church. After the Emperor's death in 1180, his widow, Irena, had the stone moved to the Emperor's burial chapel in the Pantocrator Church. The transfer of the stone slab from Ephesus to Constantinople was commemorated in situ with an inscription. According to Kinamos and Choniatas, it was Mary Magdalene who brought the stone from Jerusalem to Ephesus on her way to Tiberius in Rome to accuse Pilate and the Jews for murdering Christ. As the sources suggest, it was a slab of red marble marked by the traces of the virgin tears, which were visible on the surface. What we see here is the, uh, perhaps the place where the stone of the ancient uh, in Constantinople was fixed. The stone is lost today. In April 1204, the city of Constantinople fell to the Crusaders. It was then, at the latest, that the stone of the ancient became known in the Latin West. Robert of Clary, a French knight from the Picardy region, uh, who participated in the combat, chronicled the events and noted seeing the stone in the Pantocrator Mon Monastery. In this abbey was uh, the marble table where on our Lord was laid out uh, after he had taken down from the cross. And there too were seen the tears that Our Lady had shed over him. The Son of the Ancient was one of the most important relics in Constantinople. Its importance in both Eastern Christendom and the Latin West is apparent from the introduction of the stone as a new iconographical feature into visual images. Here, for example, uh, we see a Byzantine fresco from the end of the 13th century with a, a depiction of the stone of the Anxian. In the West, the stone of the Anxian was introduced as a new feature in visual imagery of the lamentation and entombment. This point leads me to the second direction for retracing the Jerusalemite stone, Italian Franciscan imagery. I will propose that the appearance of the stone in Franciscan images has inspired the later integration of a concrete relic, of a concrete stone, uh, to the Jer Jerusalemite um, space. Two works are attributed to the master of St. Francis are of special importance for the present discussion. These works attest to the transfer of the figure of the Stone of the Ancient into Franciscan visual imagery sometime during the 1260s and more than half a decade before the Stone of the Ancient was introduced to, Jer to Jerusalem. The first image is a depiction of the lamentation. One panel of a double-sided altarpiece from uh, San Francesco Prato in Perugia dated to uh, 1272. We see Christ lies upon a red rectangular stone with a grainy surface. The Virgin Mary sits upon the stone with Christ's upper body in her lap and his legs stretched out horizontally on the surface of the stone. Except for Christ, the Virgin Mary is the only figure whose body occupies the surface of the stone. The figure of the stone dominates the composition. Central and relatively large, its reddish color and unique grainy texture strikingly recall the descriptions of the Stone of the Ancient in Constantinople with the Virgin's tears frozen on its surface. The second example is a fresco of the Lamentation with the Stone of the Ancient found in the nave of the Lower Basilica of San Francesco in Assisi, dated um, to 1260. It is one of five frescoes depicting the Passion of Christ, originally positioned next to five frescoes depicting the life of St. Francis as I, 
analog to the um, to that of the Savio. The fresco shows Mary's lamentation over her dead son. Here too, the stone is prominent due to its sharp outlines and remarkable whiteness. A comparison of the two artworks attests to the special nature of the relic of the Stone of the Ancient. In the Perugian triptych, uh, the polyptych, so this is uh, the left one, um, the association of the Virgin Mary to the stone is demonstrated through the representation of her tears on the surface of the stone and through her position. Uh, except for Christ, she's the only figure that actually, uh, um, not only touching, she occupies the surface of the stone. In the fresco from Assisi, uh, to the right, um, we see uh, that the body of Christ is exclusively associated with the stone of the ancient. In fact, the lamenting virgin swoons away from the sacred relic. This demonstrates the double nature of the stone, which is at the one and the same time a Marian relic, absorbed with her tears, and the Christological relic, which sacredness is derived from its contact with the body of Christ. These examples indicate of the centrality of the stone of the ancient in Franciscan imagery, already before a concrete stone was emerged in Jerusalem, to where we will now return. I would like to suggest a possible explanation for the introduction of the Stone of the Ancient uh, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem during the third decade of the 14th century uh, as a Franciscan innovation. The Stone of the Ancient appeared in Jerusalem sometime before 1335. During the same period, the, the Franciscan order gradually became established in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and not long uh, before they became the official custodians of the Holy Land. In the early 30s, 1330s, in the name of the kings of Naples, uh, Friar Roger Guerin obtained permission from the Sultan uh, for the Franciscans to occupy the church and to take priority over other uh, denominations. As the church custodians, the Franciscans had to ensure that the Latin liturgical services were maintained and be responsible for pilgrims arriving from Europe. Although uh, not given absolute ownership of the site, the Franciscans were given priority where limited space prevented all clergy from celebrating together. As pilgrims accounts dated to the 1330s and 1340s testify, the Eastern Christians were required to comply with Western practices. Moreover, Franciscan pilgrims were the first to report of the stone in Jerusalem. Anderbes and other scholars have shown that the constant movement of Franciscans between Italy and the Levant in the 13th century left a mark on the visual culture uh, on both regions. The order's uh, intense involvement in Constantinople and Jerusalem during the 14th century was in accordance with their religious mission. Um, it is not noteworthy to refer to the visual and material connotations between the stone in Jerusalem and the stone in Constantinople. As we learn from the pilgrims textual and visual testimonies, the Jerusalemite stone was in fact a surface distinguished for in its surroundings by the black and white framing and, a and as a result, of material differences between the stone surface and the floor. In this slide, we see a few representations of the stone, beginning with Niccolo of Poggiboni Bonzi in the middle of the 14th century, and uh, also much later representations. Uh, in all of them, uh, we see that the stone was perceived as a two-dimensional object, uh, not object, sorry, a two-dimensional surface and not a three-dimensional object. In this sense, the surface in Jerusalem can be understood perhaps as a shadow or a trace of the stone of Constantinople. The materiality of the surface in Jerusalem in itself also had an important role in evoking the body of Christ in Jerusalem based on Christological associations between 
uh, the material of porphyry or marble, uh, which uh, the stone was uh, made of, and the sacrificial blood of Christ. So in medieval thought, porphyry was used um, in practice. Porphyry was used as the material for the mensa in portable altars, like here, uh, to foreshade um, um sorry i lost my uh, to foreshadow the transformation of the eucharist uh, realized upon it for example here in this uh, 11th century portable altar uh, the stone altar is made of green porphyry and the use of the porphyry with the intention to create symbolic associations to the eucharist is a special case of overt material, when the object announces its materiality so that, uh, in the words of Herbert Kessler, a direct relationship is established between a depicted object and the substance from which it is created. But why did the Franciscans... Uh, Emit, uh, excuse me, can I ask you to wrap it up? Because, yes, uh, uh, I only have one more paragraph. Thanks, thank you. I'm sorry, yes, thanks. So why did the Franciscans fix the stone in a new location in separation of the center of the earth? It is possible that the Franciscans wished to designate a specific spot to a tradition, the action of Christ, uh, which with the rise in the devotion to the humanity of Christ became central to Franciscan spirituality. The event of the unction um, is an intimate moment that involves physical contact. The stone has been touched by Christ's fle flesh and saturated with his sweat and blood. The physical acts of preparing the corpus for burial, laying the body, anointing it with oils and wrapping it with linen clothes are inherently connected to the human nature of Christ. The realization of the scene of the action in Jerusalem, in which Christ's humanity is accentuated, conforms to Franciscan thought, according to which it was through the focus on Christ's human nature that humanity itself could be redeemed. Within the space of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the stone of the action provided a site where Christ's sufferings in the, his human nature could be highlighted. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yamit, and uh, I think we're good to move on to our uh, to this uh, session's Q and A session. And um, I can see on the chat panel that we already have two questions. So why don't we begin with the questions, and and then um, you can either use the raise hand function or uh, write the question on the panel whatever works for you. So uh, Shmuel, would you like to, um, do you want me to read your question? You want to present your question? Shmuel? I can just respond to it since I read it. <laughs> yeah, okay. If, if yeah. that's okay with you Shmuel, or you want to clarify something? Okay, you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, I want to ask you, uh, next question, uh, uh, if, uh, if such uh, tradition uh, in Islam uh, and the uh, Islamic uh, law uh, connecting uh, in any form uh, uh, to a uh, tradition of such uh, to Mizdoza in uh, Judaism, uh, this said uh, if uh, to a touch tradition to Mithosayan Judaism where have any origins in a touch tradition to Kaaba in Islam? So Shmuel, that's an <coughs> excellent question. Uh, the mezuzah was one of the objects that um, my students and I had listed uh, to compare with other objects that were supposed to be or required to be touched. Um, so it's similar to the black stone in that both of them, um, a ritual is performed at the site of each object. 
that both objects are supposed to be protections from evil or curing disease. Um, both of them contain a text. In one case, it's God's words, the Shema Yisrael. In the other case, the text of the covenant with Adam's descendants. Um, both of them you touch when you enter something. So the mezuzah house, the black stone, when you're about to start the circumambulations around the house or the Kaaba as it's called. Um, and both of them um, are reminders of the covenant that people have with God, that the ritual is designed to do that. I think the main difference is that the, the mezuzah um, is not a unique object, right? The case that holds the text can be a, in any shape, right? They tend to be of a certain shape and they tend to have a certain uh, style, but the case itself is not as important as the text inside. Um, whereas the, the black stone is a unique object, right? There's only one of them. Well, there's eight, right? But there's only one of them in one, in one location. So um, I think that's a really good question, Shmuel. And um, I think they're in all, in, in five areas, they compare directly. And in one area, there's a big difference. So thank you. Thanks. Um, Ali? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Avi. Uh, I um, didn't open my camera this morning because uh, I think it's a little bit too early for me to be on, 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 on uh, for your guys' pleasure at least. So um, hopefully by tomorrow I'll have the time correct and be presentable. But uh, Yamit, thank you so much for your uh, presentation and Brandon as well. Um, I was enthralled by both of them. Uh, Yamit, I actually had a question, just a basic question on, on, on Porphyry in the Crusader period. Um, w w would it have been sort of um, I imported into the area? Um, are, are th is Porphyry even mined in, in, in Israel and Palestine? Or, or was it something that we assume is probably uh, from a prior Byzantine building? Or uh, uh, where, where do we assume that the, the Stone of the Ancient Porphyry actually originates from? Uh, thanks. Um, thank you uh, for the question. Um, actually, uh, Porphyry uh, was not uh, mined in uh, Israel, uh, Palestine. It was uh, basically uh, mined uh, in earlier periods uh, in Egypt. Um, but um, it is very uh, hard to to say if uh, the stone of the ancient in Jerusalem was actually made of porphyry because in the Middle Ages, porphyry uh, was uh, used as a general term to any stone which has a surface that is grained or has veins on it, meaning this could be another kind of um, marble perhaps or any other stone that has these characteristics. So uh, if, it was, um, if it was made of porphyry, then it should have been imported, uh, perhaps, as you said, from a former building uh, in the area. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, it looked like porphyry, but it was uh, some other stone. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. A question, uh, Lawrence has a question for uh, Yamit. Lawrence. Yeah, thank you, uh, both of you, for your fascinating talks. And uh, yeah, a question to Yamit. And uh, maybe I didn't fully uh, get what you were saying. There was also a technical issue with my internet here. But uh, um, did I understand correctly that the uh, stone of unction in Constantinople actually disappeared, or do we know anything of his of the whereabouts of this relic? Um, personally, I don't know about any fragments or uh, stone of unction relics in in uh, Latin church treasuries or anything. Um, and uh, then we have the the appearance of the present stone of unction in Jerusalem. Is there any possibility that the two are identical? Thank you very much for the question. I actually did not uh, relate to this uh, point in my presentation. Um, the stone of the unction in Constantinople uh, continued to appear in uh, textual sources 
uh, up until the Uthman uh, conquest of Constantinople. Um, so for a period of time, there were two stones of the action, right. one in Constantinople, another one in Jerusalem. Most pilgrims, uh, those who visited both places, do not say anything about it, about this duplicity. But there are a few, like William Way, who says uh, he comes to Jerusalem, he sees the Stone of the Ancien, and he says, but I know this is not the uh, correct stone, because the uh, authentic stone is in uh, Constantinople. Um, I don't know uh, anything about the future, um, uh, what happened with the... Uh, with the stone from Constantinople. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, I uh, think we have to conclude this panel and um, go for a break. And um, no refreshments will be served today. Apologies for that. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting panel. And um, uh, we, are supposed to be back in 15 minutes? Correct, Daniela? yeah, 15 minutes. Yoni, mm -hmm. okay, 15 minutes. So yeah, thank you very so. much and uh, see, you, see, you, see you really soon. Thank you. Daniela and I uh, live in Jerusalem and we commute to Beersheba to teach and we had the privilege over the past, what, three, four years to discuss the exact topic of this session more than once, uh, sharing and comparing notes. Uh, I should say I'm a professor